and the name of the three are what? And those are the only disciples we know. I'm not going to ask you about the others. Nobody knows the names of the others. <laughs> so there are three, 12, 70, and crowd. So what Jesus did, he understood. Remember, I talked to you about wanderers and followers and achievers and leaders. So Jesus was very clear about who fell into what category and how he utilized them and what he had them for. For example, the three. Everywhere he went, that was important, he took the three with him. Is that not true? Okay. So somebody tell me, where did Jesus spend most of his time? With the three or with the crowd? With the three. Where do you spend most of your time? So let me ask that question again. <laughs> Where did Jesus spend most of his time? With the three or the crowd? The three. And where do we spend most of our time? With the crowd. Therefore, we are getting the results that we are getting. <laughs> think of it this way. Just, 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 just think it out loud with me. So when Jesus launched his company known as the church. You with me on that? He wanted to go global. He was not going to be a local person. He wanted to go global. Romans, I mean, uh, Matthew 28, 19, 20 says what? Go into where? All the world. So he wasn't going to go global. So when Jesus went global, he did not want, he did not, he knew it would not happen with the crowd because there are four distinct uses of these people. Here we go. The three were, <coughs> excuse me, the three were there to think. The 12 were to organize. The 70 were to do, and the crowd was for public relations. I want, uh, I want you to get this now, because this is, unless, uh, let me make a statement and come back to this. I'm gonna work on this for a little bit. Unless, you are comfortable with not treating everybody equally. Okay, let me say it in a more positive way. You can't treat people equally. You can treat people fairly, but not equally. Okay, how many of you have two or more children? Two or more children. Can I see your hands? Two or more children. How many of you know each child brings out a different personality from you? <laughs> uh, so, so, Rachel, my firstborn, Rachel, my firstborn, all I had to do was look at her. Just like that. My nextborn, Debbie, hmm. Took after her mother's side of the family. <laughs> oh yeah, Debbie. I, 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 you know, she was just totally different. Still, still is, totally different. I'll tell you one story. She was about four or five, and. Uh, she had done something wrong, and I used to spank my children with a table tennis ping pong paddle. Leaves no marks. <laughs> and makes a big noise. So I was there. You know how daddies give lecture before they... So I'm there with my ping pong paddle in my hand, my table tennis paddle in my hand, and I'm giving her my daddy lecture. This is what she says to me. She had to be four or five. She looks at me, she says, are you gonna spank me or just talk? <laughs> so how many of you know that everybody brings out different things from you? So you may love them equally, but you don't treat them equally. Is that, is that true? Okay. 
So unless you get comfortable with what Jesus was willing to do was to treat people differently, but love them all. He died for the world. He died for everybody. But the, these three were there to think. When he went on the mount, the highest moment he went in his life, he took his, these three with them, right? In the Mount of Transfiguration. Lowest moment of his life in the Garden of Gethsemane. Raising Jairus' daughter. The, the, this was where it was. The 12 were to organize. He's feeding the 5,000, had them sit down into groups of 50, 60, give the food out to them, those kind of things. They were to do, the 70 were to do, they were for public relations. Now, if you ask the doing people to think, they can't, that's not what they do. So if there's somebody who is a doer and you say to them, can you give me a plan? They can't do that. Uh, you know what we do? We sit under an apple tree hoping for oranges. So once you know in your church who is for what role, then you will not give thinking people. There's some people who come to a meeting who just talk. You give them a job to do, their, their contribution to you is just to come and do what? Talk. That's all they do. Unless you know that that is their gift. Because this is what we do in our meetings. If, if we got this table here and everybody's talking, you know, somebody's talking really, really good, really, really good. When it's time to give the assignment, we give it to the biggest talker. And have you noticed they'd never do anything? Because we don't understand that they have different callings, different gifts on their life. So unless you know who your three are, you're going to keep going to the crowd. And if you're going to keep spending time with your crowd, you're never going to get the high results that you need. And when you don't get the high results, so this is what we do. We keep trying to promote church growth through these people. We say to them, bring your friends. Isn't that what we say? Bring your friends. How's that working out for you? Christians have no friends. After two years of being saved, they have no unsaved friends. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. So they are not the ones who are going to grow your church. These two categories are the ones that are going to grow your church. So you've got to know who the wanderers are, who the followers are, who the achievers are, and who the leaders are. So as we talked earlier, it really has to do with how you understand systems and structures. So I can give you a couple more examples. So systems are how you do things, structures, who you do it with. So as soon as Jesus came out for ministry, what was that, Luke chapter 4? Yeah, Luke chapter 4. At the age of 30, he comes out to do ministry, and he's baptized by John the, uh, John the Baptist. After that, he goes into the wilderness to be tempted, and immediately after that, the first thing he does is start choosing his disciples. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 he is choosing his disciples. Now, he knew that before he could do anything, he had to have the structure in place. And that was going to be the disciples. In Luke chapter 10, he gives them the system. You remember he sends them out two and two? Probably Luke chapter 10 verse 1 is the most strategic thing that is written about Jesus. It says that he sent them out 70 disciples, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Send them out two and two, and here's the most strategic part. Into every place he planned to go. Okay, work it out with me, work it out with me. 70 disciples, 
Two and two is how many groups? 35. And it tells us he sends them out into every place he planned to go. So do you think Jesus had 35 places on an itinerary? Of course he did. And then he appointed them and said, you to go to Capernaum, you to go to Bethphaga, you to go to Nazareth, you to go to Bethlehem, you to go to Jerusalem. Are you following me? He sent them on assignment. And then, st still talking about the structural, uh, the system part of it, he tells them when you get there, this is what you're going to say. If they receive you, this is what you're going to say. <laughs> if they kick you out, this is what you're going to say. He created a system. So, if, so in our calls, you know, do you ever get those calls from the call center? Somebody from India trying to talk like they're... I get those all the time. I talk, I talk to them. Hey, man, where are you? My name is Larry. No, your name is not Larry. You are in Bangalore, India. I know who you are. You're not La All I know is you're not Larry. You should, have, you should have conversation that they're human beings. Just talk to them. You don't have to buy anything. But those call centers have a script, right? And the script says, say this, then they'll say that. Then if they, if they say yes, then you go down this script. If they say no, then you go down this script. Isn't that what call centers do? Well, Jesus had a call center. Read your Bible. He gave them a script. He said, when you go into a place, say to them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. If they receive you, bless that house. And then he says to them, eat whatever they give you. I know you are Jewish boys and you don't eat bacon <laughs> and sausage. But if they, if they give you pork chops, eat it. He tells them how to behave themselves. And then he says, if they say no, and they're going to kick you out of the house, dust off your feet and say what to them? The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Because he knew how to leverage the people that he was calling. Our challenge is we really don't know who is who. Because we think that everyone can be a leader. I think everyone can be a certain kind of leader. But if you're looking for somebody who does three things. Who sees it. Takes. Pursues it. And then helps others see it. If that's what you're looking for. That's going to be the minority. You, you, can, you can get people to achievers earlier than you can get them to leaders. Our challenge is that we try to do things with people that uh, we know we have, we have spent hours and hours and hours with them and nothing's happened, right? And so we spend our best energy over here when it needs to be over here. I'm going to help you understand how to decide who these three are in your church. How many of you are pastors? Can I see your hand? Pastors. Pastors. Looks like some of you have resigned your church already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, pastors, pastors. Here's my question. Here's my question. Now listen to this question real carefully. If you were relocating from the city you are in and going to another city. And you're going to go to another city and start a church there. Not counting any family members. Who would be the five people from your present church you would take with you? I know some of you are saying none of them. <laughs> now that's a very important question. Because I have two parts to this question. Question number one is, A, do you know who you're going to take with you? Because these are people who have your DNA. They have your culture. They understand you. They are loyal to you. You can, you can do something with them. 
So you know Jesus didn't choose these people just to have fun. He was launching a global company. These were going to be the board of directors of the first, of the headquarters. The second question is, if you have people on your team that you would not take with you, why are they on your team now? Is that making sense to you? Because we have not stopped and asked ourselves, who's my three, who's my 12, who's my 70, and who's just part of the crowd? So we just, in, in America, you know, Easter Sunday for Americans is the biggest Sunday. Maybe the second biggest Sunday is coming up in a couple of weeks for Americans. That would be uh, Mother's Day. So churches were packed out on Easter. They added new services, more services for Easter. What happens the Sunday after Easter? Very depressing. Because they came, people came for Easter. And let me tell you why that happens. It happens because churches are thinking about crowd. So we, we put a lot of energy and effort and time and planning into Easter Sunday. But as much energy and time needs to go into the two Sundays after Easter. Because when they come to Easter, they see one, side, one kind of performance. They come the Sunday after, it is like, okay, Walmart. Easter is Nordstrom, Saks Fifth Avenue, Lord and Taylor. You following me? Next Sunday is back to normal. Because we are trying to play to the crowd. Jesus never played to the crowd. He always played over here because he knew that if he was going to go global and his company was going to sustain, it had to focus up here. So how much of your time is being given up here? And last thing I want to say about this is the people who never give you trouble get the least amount of your attention. People who are always there rarely get the kind of attention than that person who's always creating problems for you. What did Jesus do? He said, let the dead do what? Bury the... Uh -huh. He said, the poor you'll always have with you. But he paid attention up here. Because of them, after all was said and done, on the day of Pentecost, there were about 120 people. And they changed the world. Because of whom we are in this room.